Welcome everyone to tonight's event. Princeton Public Library is really thrilled to have two prominent poets, Kevin Young and Tracy K. Smith, with us tonight to discuss the African-American poetic tradition. I am Janie Herman, the library's manager at adult programming, and I will be your host for the evening. Before we get started, there's a few housekeeping items about Crowdcast. One is if you're having any troubles with viewing or sound effects, uh, there is a way to get audio video help. Uh, there's a little link there in the left-hand corner that says get audio video help. In addition, uh, my colleague Kim Dorman, who is co-leading this project with me, is online. And uh, you could put something in the comments and Kim might be able to give you a little bit of advice. We will be doing a question and answer at the end of the session. And you can see where there's an ask a question button. So feel free to drop your questions in there. The chat is open right now, but I will be closing it down for the main portion of the event. So tonight's program is a part of a year long national public humanities initiative called Lift Every Voice, Why African-American Poetry Matters. It's a multifaceted exploration um, of African-American poetry, the perspective it offers on American history and the ongoing struggle for racial justice and the universality of its imaginative response to the personal experience of black Americans over uh, three centuries. To extend the initiative nationwide, Library of America awarded 49 libraries and other institutions grants for public programming with poets and scholars. We here at Princeton Public Library are very proud to have been selected as part of this cohort and will be hosting additional events later this month and in early 2021. So please stay tuned to our e-newsletters and our announcements to watch out for them. In addition, the Library of America launched a website AfricanAmericanPoetry.org that features video readings and commentary, a timeline of the African American poetic tradition, and much more. I encourage you to visit and explore what it has to offer. The link to this website is in the call to action button. And in addition, tonight's event will be recorded and made available on there at a point in the near future. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to thank the Library of America and the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture and also acknowledge the generous support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and Emerson Collective. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guests. Tracy K. Smith served as the 22nd United States Poet Laureate from 2017 to 2019, and is the author of four acclaimed collections of poetry, including, most recently, Wade in the Water and Life on Mars, which received the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 2012. Her memoir, Ordinary Light was a finalist for the National Book Award for Nonfiction in 2015. Tracy Smith serves as the chair of the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University right here in our hometown and also hosts the daily poetry podcast, The Slowdown. She'll be in conversation with Kevin Young, who is the director of the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture and poetry editor of The New Yorker, where he also hosts their poetry podcast. He is the author of 13 books of poetry and prose, most recently Brown. And of course, he is the editor of the book of poetry that we are here tonight to discuss. Exciting news is that he will become the next director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture starting in January 2021. And so now I would like to welcome our guest to the, to the screen. Here is Kevin and here is Tracy. And I'm going to let those two take it away. and. So thank you very much, and here we go. Thank you. Hi, Kevin. Hey, how are you? I'm good. I'm always excited to get the chance to see and hear you, even virtually. Likewise. How are you doing? I'm, I'm all right. I'm looking um, at wonderful poems in the anthology. So yeah, I really want to talk to you about what um, what that process um, was like for you. But I was wondering if you might feel like kicking it off with maybe a few poems of your own. Would you would you read oh, them? Uh, sure, I can read something. Uh, the poems in um, there's one long poem in uh, the anthology, and it doesn't quite suit. But uh, maybe I'll read a little of that. Uh, I'll just read maybe two poems: one from Brown, and then a poem in the, from the anthology. This is a uh, from a sequence of sonnets called "De La Soul Is Dead," um, and I just was trying to write about uh, what it was like to be black uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, when music was really good. Um, and um, just sort of what it felt like in this moment, uh, which comes up in the poem that you'll see. Um, and it seemed like a particular moment. And the poems uh, are kind of crowned in that 
they the last line of one poem becomes the next line uh, of the first of the next poem. First line of the next poem. De La Soul is dead. We were black then, not yet African American, so we danced every chance we could get. Thursdays and Saturdays we chant the roof. The roof, the roof is on fire. We don't need no water. And folks' perms began to turn. We had begun to dread or wear locks anyway. Our temples, we'd fade. We said word. And death said dang and down and fly. We gave no goodbyes, just all right then, or bet. No one was dead yet. Uh, you were maybe at that party. <laughs> Thank you. <I> might. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the poem, I uh, you know, it's very strange when you do an apology, do you, like what of yours or if anything is in it. Um, but so I put in a longer poem called um, Money Road, uh, which is about going to Mississippi uh, and taking a kind of pilgrimage to where Emmett Till was last seen, um, which is a town called Money, Mississippi. And the drive is really strange. You drive, you know, this from Greenwood, which is a fairly small town, but where Black Power, the term was coined by Stokely Carmichael in a park there. I mean, you know, it's a fraught with history and ghosts. And so there's all these kind of ghosts on the way, um, including there's a strange kind of plantation uh, that you can like stay in. Like you can stay in like a, uh, <laughs> like a kind of like, not a plantation, like a um, kind of sharecropper house, like, you know, there's an outhouse, a fake outhouse, and there's cotton. It's really disturbing. So um, that appears. And I'll just read a few uh, little sections. Even the Salvation Army thrift store closed, bars over every door. We're on our way again, away, along the money road, past grand houses and port cashiers set back from the lane, crossing the bridge to find markers of what's no more there. Even the underpass bears a name. It's all too grave. The fake sharecropper homes of Tallahatchie Flats rented out along the road, staged bottle trees chasing away nothing. The new outhouse whose crescent door foreign tourists pay extra for. Cotton planted in strict rows for show. A quiet snow globe of pain I want to shake. While the flakes fall like ash, we race the train to reach the place Emmett Till last whistled or smiled or did nothing. Money more a crossroads than the crossroads be, its gnarled tree. The Bryant store facing the tracks now turned the color of earth, tumbling down slow as the snow, white and insistent as the woman who sent word of that uppity boy, her men who yanked you out your uncle's home into the yard, into oblivion, into this store, abutting the money gin co whose sign worn away now reads un or sin, I swear, whose giant gin fans, like those lashed and anchored to your beaten body, still turn, shot, dumped, Dredge your face, not even a mask, a marred, unspared, sightless stump. All your mother insists we must see to know what they did to my baby. The true Tallahatchie twisting south, the Delta, death's second cousin, once removed you down for only the summer to leave the stifling city, where later you will be waked displayed, defiant, a dark glass. There are things that cannot be seen, but must be bar buried barely. This place no one can keep. It keeps going, but that's uh, good enough for now. Thank you. What I always love, um, and I hear it in so many different ways in your work is this, beautiful ability to make the sense of history something intimate, something visceral that we can touch and move through. And hearing you read that poem, you get to the moment where you use the, the word waked 
And I feel like the poem actually puts me in a state where I, I want to believe he's waking up. He's going to wake oh, up. That's you know? a, I love um, that. It's so um, it's so moving to to hear how you can bring rhythm and this kind of deep attention to what feels at once like a private work, and of course, what we know is a large and ongoing public public work, which is um, recovering um, and writing some of the occlusions of history in a way as it relates to to black people in this country. Um, and then I hear in De La Soul is Dead, that room where I feel like I think I was at that party. And um, I want to say that I felt like I claimed poetry as a vocation really upon hearing you read when we were both undergrads at Harvard. Um, and I would love for you to talk a little bit about um, when and how you claimed poetry and maybe also what it feels like at this point in your career to look back at the map of your, of your yeah. changed. Uh, well, that's a great honor that I, if I helped to uh, sail some ship for you, though you were well on your way, I know. And, um, you know, thinking back on those times, it felt like poetry was sort of at hand and it was a kind of unusual time. I felt like um, that we knew poets, we studied with poets like Seamus and I studied with Lucy and um, they were like right there. It was felt like the gods walked amongst us or uh, we could, you know, write too. That was kind of, uh, so I think feel like claiming poetry is a constant act. You know, I don't think there was like this one time. I do remember um, being very uncomfortable about the idea, even though I was writing the poems that eventually became my first book. So it, it almost, you know, the writing was more, uh, was ahead of my feeling comfortable with being a poet. Though I think if you asked other people, they'd probably say, oh yeah, he writes poetry, you know, I mean. Was that discomfort, uh, what, obligation to something else, to parents? I mean, it's a big word, poet. Uh, but I also think, it, yeah, like growing up, I didn't know poets, you know, my family's from Louisiana and uh, there were preachers and musicians and farmers uh, and folks who made culture and made culture that I think is really enduring. Um, and so to claim a thing that was of that, but not exactly that, I think was was hard for me uh, or took me a while. Uh, and I think it's people like Bob Kaufman, uh, the great poet who I uh, got to include in the anthology, um, helped me. I mean, he has these poems or, you know, like he'll just say Bob Kaufman, come a poet as a, as a kind of, you know, title. And with him, you know, he's saying like, by the way, you know, like this has all these other things with it. And I could say a lot, you know, activist or, surrealist or all those things, but this word encapsulates that. And so for me, uh, people like Kaufman and just reading around in the tradition, that's what made me feel comfortable in it. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking today about how your first book, Most Way Home, opens with um, a poem that is written in the form of a reward poster, right? It's yeah. called a reward. Um, and it just makes me feel like the archive has always been um, a resource for you, um, you know, and of course now it's what you do, it's what you're building. Sure. Um, it has been for some time. This anthology is an extension of that. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, about sure. artifacts and papers and... Uh, well, you know, papers are, are so funny because uh, I think everyone has papers, they don't always know it, you know, and I think one thing the museum has, has been really great at, and the Schomburg's been doing this for a century, is letting ordinary people realize that their connection to history, it's a little like the first question you asked, because to me, that's one of the points, like anyone can be a poet, everyone has an archive, you know, and, and they carry it with them, it, and especially with Black culture, it's all the more important to recognize the ways that some of those things are overlooked and under, uh, seen even by black people sometimes. And, uh, you know, I thought a lot about it, uh, starting with this idea of the shadow book and the gray album, which is an idea of uh, books that aren't there. And doing the anthology was a real chance to kind of get those books that are almost there in between the pages, uh, you know, and, and talking to each other because mm -hmm. that's the other thing about archives is <clears throat> they, they ha are having this conversation. I feel like, you know, you close the building, you shut the doors and they're still whispering mm -hmm. amongst themselves. Um, you know, and I like to think at Schomburg of James Baldwin talking to my Angelou, who he's friends with, or uh, Lorraine Hansberry, who he's good friends with. Um, you know, these are archives that are there, and I think of them as very much living. You know, uh, they get added to, but they also get uh, rediscovered in ways uh, that are important. 
<coughs> excuse me. Uh, and I, I think that we uh, ignore that at our peril, like the, the importance of them, the fragility, but also the resilience, you know, and we have to kind of support uh, that archival effort, but I would say it extends to all of us in some ways. Um, and, you know, the job of a place like the National Museum uh, is to really think ahead and think like, how do we capture now? How do we record this moment after this extraordinary summer of unrest and protest, uh, the largest mass movement in history? Um, and how do we capture that? And what was fascinating to me doing the anthology, which I was finishing the introduction of, this summer is the ways that it was already uh, uh, being thought about by poets. You know, uh, I don't mean to get too like, you know, mystical about it, but I think poets are often prescient. They're writing so much from the sides and from the corners and uh, from heights and from depths that they sometimes are able to name a thing before it's named otherwise. Uh, and that's one of our jobs. I mean, I think of what Lucille Clifton used to say uh, all the time is that poetry is meant to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And that kind of combination you see uh, at work in African-American poetry and, and throughout, you know, starting with Phyllis Wheatley, slavery. And, you know, as you said, my first book has a poem uh, of a runaway slave ad. Um, and then, you know, to the present, you know, those things are, are with us all, but um, black poets have been really writing and writing through those things for centuries. And I, I think that was my revelation uh, <clears throat> was just, wow, it's, you know, a quarter millennium just on this continent publishing, you know, like we're not talking about the unsung, you know, the black and unknown bards, you know, um, we're also talking about the ways that, you know, uh, there's this continuity and context. And I want to kind of capture both of those things in the book. Mm -hmm. I think you do that so powerfully. And you mentioned the introduction. I think that's just such a beautiful um, synthesis of what we've often defaulted to viewing as these discrete and separate periods, movements, schools, um, and trends. And I feel like what you show us is that all of these disparate traditions are working together toward what we might describe as like the single centuries long project that is um, ongoing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's this ongoing epic, you know, mm -hmm. and you're one of our epic, you're, you're the high, one of the heights of our epic. So, um, you know, I'm not going to leave before you read something. So I don't know if I'll do that now or wait a moment. <laughs> I'll do it now because I, I have lots of questions for you. Um, I'll share two new poems because I have them before me um, and they're brief and they come also um, out of, you know, processing, but also just enduring this time that we are, we find ourselves in sure. and all the many different um, facets of our, of our reality that have begun to feel so um, urgent and, and painful to me in different, in new ways. Um, so this poem is called Dock of the Bay. Oh, Otis, for so long, I did not know what you knew and sang of sweetly, as if it were not piquant and heavy and bleak. Fridays, my father crooned along, glass of amber and ice in hand. I thought it was about ease, the end of the week, not the white world snarling through its teeth. Looks like nothing's gonna change. Everything still remains the same. No, Otis, we are not lazy. We are not even particularly angry. But look how we strain beneath steady weather. Morning sun, evening come. Otis, brother, the line of us shoulder to shoulder under what will not go quietly into the ground. And um, this is a poem called Mothership. You cannot see the mothership in space, it and she being made of the same thing. All our mothers hover there in the ceaseless blue black, watching it ripple and dim to the prized pale blue in which we spin. We who are black and you too our mothers know each other there fully and finally. 
they see what some here see and call anomaly, the way the sight of me might set off a shiver in another mother's son, a deadly, silent digging in, a stolid refusal to budge, the viral urge to stake out what on solid ground is authority and sometimes also territory. Our mothers, knowing better, call it folly. Wow, those are amazing. Thank you. I love when you touch on music um, in your work, which you know you do quite a bit, though I don't always think of you as a music poet because you're such a philosophy, you're, you're a philosophizer about the music, which I think is so smart, you know? Um, it's been, um, I, I want to ask you a little bit about how you are living in this, this moment, you know, this year. Um, those poems are new and I feel like the, the work that I've been doing has really felt so different, mm. not necessarily in terms of like form, although I do feel a difference in terms of that, but really um, in terms of what it's helping me to do, sure. which is kind of like just keep going right. um, during what has felt just, just, you know, like, I guess, bleak, dark, heavy, surprising, and unrelenting. Um, I'm often, when I, when I was traveling, when we used to travel and things. I remember that. <laughs> I would have uh, younger people oftentimes in audiences ask, how do you, how do you, what forms of self-care do you practice? Right, right. There. Uh, I think Tracy has frozen. We were having internet connections earlier. Um, this is pretty oh, wait, she might be back. So why don't we, she was talking about self-care. Maybe you want to just go on that and we'll see if we can get Tracy back. Okay. Um, I think she was going to ask me about that, but I wanted to hear her answer because, <laughs> you know, uh, my best, uh, I mean, I love art and plants. There's a plant behind me, I became uh, much more <laughs> interested in like growing a thing, which I think is, you know, that isn't a poem. Uh, and I think that was really healthy for me. Um, but obviously I think it's a trying time for everyone. Uh, and poetry has been really helpful for me. I, you know, I, I think during this anthology, there is so much uh, sort of in the weeds of it. You know, you're, you're trying to figure out pages and who goes where and, you know, organization, all these things that um, happened and you know the good parts of that were that it forced me to really think uh, about generations uh, the book is divided pretty uh, much into uh, generations and um, I don't think I would have done that if it hadn't been a process um, there's we decided pretty early on that I wanted to go to the present as much as possible and not stop say 10 years ago or something um, because there's been such a burst in, in the good poetry being written now by people and the poetry of our time, I think, is being written by young people. And there's a larger kind of question. Hey there. Um, <clears throat> I'm talking a little bit about self-care, but also about the anthology. And one of the things I really love, and I was I was um, talking about the young, younger writers in this uh, book. I mean, one of the things that happened to me is realizing that you and I aren't the youngest generation anymore. That was a bit of a shock, you know, but um, I got over it. And, you know, the excitement, of course, is there's so many great younger writers who are uh, younger than us who are, you know, doing it to it. I mean, they've been writing for a while in many cases and publishing many, many books. So uh, and being up for awards. So it's not like we're doing them a favor. It was more like, how do I include and understand and, and provide the context for this centuries of, of uh, people writing? Uh, and I think of this as a, a current and new renaissance. I love the way you describe it in the introduction, where you also talk about, you know, they're, they are inheritors of the very same traditions of, of struggle uh, that we all um, descend from, but they also have these other models of possibility, um, just by the fact of having been born in a time when African American poetry has really revolutionized American poetry. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about like some of the discoveries, either like current or sure. archival that you made? And I want to hold up the book because it's so beautiful. Oh, right. Everybody has seen it. Um, yes. Um, well, uh, I mean, one of the people I, I've mentioned uh, elsewhere is a poet by the name of May Cowdery, M-A-E, 
uh, and she, she uses the middle initial V, Cowdery, fascinating poet. And, and in a way, she's the sort of last of the Harlem Renaissance poets that are in the book. Though there are people who outlived her, she unfortunately died. Um, and she was a powerful writer. She published a book uh, in the 30s um, toward the end of what people think of as the Renaissance, though I make an argument that it should continue past, say, 32 or the 29 or whatever. Um, for the very reason that many of the women writers uh, Zora Neale Hurston didn't publish books till the 30s, so like we would lose a lot of writers if we think of uh, it that way. But it was really important to have someone like Cowdery who uh, wrote love poems to men and women, um, who was very uh, much comfortable in her skin, it seems, and, and writes also about discomfort if she uh, isn't comfortable. Um, and and I, I think her ability to be herself was a bit like what you're saying, like she benefited from the Harlem Renaissance writer. She knew Langston Hughes, uh, wrote him letters and things like that. But then she wrote poems that were very much her own uh, and they're meditative and, and strange. Uh, another weird sort of discovery where the number of, um, it's not even weird, it, it makes total sense, but um, haiku poems, you know, starting in the 20s where um, black writers turn to haiku uh, and you see it all the way to one of the, uh, preeminent people of the forum, Sonia Sanchez, and her invention of the blues haiku, I think, was really important because she's able, and we've talked about this, and we recently were, had a conversation uh, for the Brooklyn Book Festival and talked about this on stage, uh, about you know the importance of haiku and what it did for her. And um, I think that clarity for people, uh, and people were able to make those poems kind of political, um, people like Etheridge Knight um, as well. But also, for instance, um, a poet like Richard Wright, who you know wrote poems that were more political, some okay blues poems, but his haiku were just tremendous, you know, and he wrote them like crazy, even from his hospital bed, the story goes. And to have some of those there, I think shows this different side of him uh, from the realist, you know, like uh, social realist kind of <laughs> writer. Um, and you sort of see this other side. And I think that's really important um, that I really want to dig up uh, not just writers we might not know, but writer sides of writers that we don't always get to see, uh, and including things like Lucille Clifton's jump rope rhymes that she recorded, or uh, longer poems, which we don't always get to see. <clears throat> uh, I think that can often, you know, even in an anthology, you can include all that stuff, but I tried to have as much of that as possible, or at least indicate that there's more to see, you know, and it again goes to that epic impulse that I think is all over the tradition. Yeah, I mean, the really exciting thing about what you're able to do is, you know, you're you're expanding our understanding, not only of the poet's sense of the craft that they're connected to and what, what different traditions they're drawing from, but also um, you're expanding our sense of history, even the occlusions, like bringing in the women um, who published later and um, letting us think about what silence and what opportunity um, looked like or didn't look like at different times. It, it changes our understanding, I think, of community and of-, of Sure, the, the I hope so. I mean, sorry. Um, I'm just excited to talk with <laughs> um, I think the other thing I would say is people would maybe be surprised that the 1980s, which you know uh, we were starting to write during, you there weren't a lot of poets published. You know, uh, a poet like Christopher Gilbert, terrific poet, had one book, you know, and um, that uh, he's recently been kind of reclaimed and rediscovered and his papers ended up at Emory where I used to work. Um, and there was a, another whole manuscript in there that has since seen the light of day, which is wonderful. Um, but he's such an essential poet and explains almost a kind of missing link or leap between the 60s, 70s and these poetries of the 80s that were, he was able to write a poem about Stevie Wonder while braid, his sister's braiding his hair. You know, I mean, he was able to write about sort of pop culture and philosophy and think about these things in expansive ways that, um, you know, I see echoes in all of our work today. Um, uh, and even the poems you were reading, your new poems, one could talk about them in terms of Christopher Gilbert. And if we lose Christopher Gilbert, we don't have a language to understand that continuity. Uh, that doesn't to say that, you know, um, I think poets who are writing from our time, I think we're taking up a different slightly different mantle, but we need to understand that history. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, you know, really excited to hear your sort of new work and, and you know, I've gotten to see it and publish some of the New Yorker and, and it really is tremendous. Um, and I hope you feel that when you're working on it, though, 
Uh, I know it isn't always obvious when you're sitting there working. Um, I definitely feel like um, poetry is, you know, I've always known poetry helps me live. Poetry is sort of a, a sustaining space to ask and reflect. Um, I feel like I'm listening to our ancestry in a different way. Mm -hmm. I feel like the poems, um, and we know many, many poets have a, a sense of practice or belief that does go into strange spaces. We've talked a lot about Lucille Clifton's sure. um, experiences with Ouija boards and, and visitations and visions. Um, but I feel something, something um, a vigorous sense of kinship and presence. Um, and I think it comes out of this, this sense of struggle. Those are two great words, kinship and presence. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you always have written about that, but I love hearing how it's uh, there for you more. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I for me, my next book is so much about Louisiana, which I can't go to now, and uh, you know, but it's very much about sort of these pilgrimages to Louisiana. And so, looking back on writing it, it feels like a different world, even though I sort of finished it during quarantine. Um, and there's that weird feeling, I mean, that I think everything we're writing now is kind of echoed with it uh, or, or infused with it. And we don't totally know what that means. And being at somewhere like The New Yorker, what's fascinating is you can sort of see that in real time. You know, there's a, there are trends that people don't even know are happening. Um, and I see enough poetry that I'm like, well, I would say that this is a thing that people are doing. Um, uh, and now what I see is people are really trying to return to writing about the world around us, you know, um, doesn't mean they're not uh, doing so through imagination, but, uh, and I think your recent poems are great examples of that. How do you kind of write as yourself, but admit that things are different? Um, and I think black poets have been doing that a long time. You know, they, Emmett Till, is, it's not like George Floyd is the first figure that folks have been writing about. Um, and I was struck when I was doing the anthology and my poem it's, uh, itself is about Emmett Till about Till's legacy and how he's one of the people that someone like Gwendolyn Brooks writes so beautifully about uh, and powerfully about. Uh, and maybe I'll read that poem. And if you have another question or two, but I know there's also questions from folks out in the world. Um, but, you know, she has that long poem um, uh, about, uh, I, it's one of the most incredible poems because of its, uh, it's, I wouldn't call it empathy, but it's some active imagination. It's a Bronzeville mother loiters in Mississippi. Meanwhile, a Mississippi mother burns bacon. And it's referring to Emma Till's mother, Mamie Till, as the Bronzeville mother. And then the other mother is uh, the wife of one of the murderers of Emma Till. And to be able to kind of take that perspective and see the horror through her eyes is really a powerful act of imagination and, and uh, empathy. Um, but also of critique, you know, it's a powerful poem. And the la and after that poem, there's a poem, as you know, called The Last Quatrain of the Ballad of Emmett Till. Uh, and I'll just read that. The Last Quatrain of the Ballad of Emmett Till by Gwendolyn Brooks. After the murder, after the burial. Emmett's mother is a pretty faced thing, the tint of pulled taffy. She sits in a red room, drinking black coffee. She kisses her killed boy, and she is sorry. Chaos in windy grays through a red prairie. And, you know, Brooks grew up uh, or was born in Topeka, Kansas, where I lived for a time, uh, you know, as a kid. And so that red prairie, I think, is so powerful to me that, that she's trying to conjure. It's like this wind that starts in Colorado and makes its way to Chicago. Uh, and she's really captured that kind of bleakness, but also this kind of, uh, I don't know, her, her, her uh, uprightness amongst the chaos. Uh, and afterwards, the aftermath of, of such violence that we're still seeing. You know, we're yeah. still in that red prairie ourselves. How do we write about it? How do we survive it? So you just got dark there. Uh, and my overhead lights <laughs> went out on the timer. Um, you know, you talk about... The, Brooks's ability to enter into these different perspectives with such um, poise um, and courage reminds me of the ways that, and you talk about this, Black voices have often claimed allegiance to a we, and oftentimes that I, the, 
the first, you know, the individual pronoun has often um, made space for an unspoken or implied we that sure. is a community of blackness that spans time. Um, and I love the way that I've been thinking about this a lot lately um, as, a, as a reader, a teacher and a writer, and I, I love the way that you describe it in the introduction. Um, I wanna maybe like my last question for you, um, we, we're in a moment of what might be hopeful transition. You're in a moment of transition going from the Schomburg, which is this really amazing research uh, library. And it's also a, a local community space where people come and they have an allegiance to. Um, and you'll be going to Washington um, to what, you know, what is the, what is the sense of the we that, that you're envisioning? Um, and I wanted you to answer that in any context, sure. as a poet or as a director of a cultural institution or, or as an American citizen. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that we as many different things, uh, you know, ultimately it's we the people and this idea of what people uh, need and do and some of what they need is connection and some of what we're missing is that often. And I feel like some of the fracturedness that I think many of us feel is, is uh, both existential and, you know, b because this is how we're able to connect is through devices. And, you know, a lot of us just went through Thanksgiving and, uh, you know, it's so different and strange. Um, and it, in a good way, perhaps it t returns you to the people you care about uh, most um, and feel safest with in all senses. But I also think there's a way in which, um, you know, people are also really eager to discover things. And, and so that we, to me, is also kind of expanding, if that's possible, because uh, I saw over the summer, certainly we did a Black Liberation Reading List, for instance, and with the anthology, which has gotten just a great response, people are dying for, you know, uh, Black culture, for seeing it firsthand, for not having it mediated, um, and, and to experience and hold in their hands a bit of Blackness. Uh, and I say this about Black people, you know, that's the we too. You know, we are very much, um, uh, driving culture in different ways and, and how do we capture that uh, avant-garde nature and then that, you know, popular equality too that I think is is inherent in the tradition and for me that it's inherent in the poetry that is being written um, but also in, in the reception and the way that people are, I think, m more eager than ever to be part of that we, uh, we the reader. I mean, you know, I think of that in lots of different ways. Um, so for me, you know, I always go back to the blues and the blues sort of offer that uh, when Bessie Smith is saying, I went up and stood on some high old lonesome hill. She's not saying, you know, only I did that. And it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> She's saying like, we all are in one moment on that hill. And that's what the blues does is it testifies and it gets you past that experience. And uh, poetry, I think, encapsulates that beautifully. Um, and for me, it, it can give me hope. It's that thing where side songs sometimes spur you on. Um, you know, so at least you know you're not alone. Um, and I've just made a ton of mixes. Uh, this goes back to your self care. Uh, you know, like I'm 19 again, you know, like just making mixes to sort of capture that and see if someone else is singing about it, uh, how I feel without knowing me. And I think poetry does that in such an important way. It shows us that intimacy, that resistance, that joy, um, but also the sorrow that, because uh, the joy that Lucy Clifton and others are talking about hard won, you know, it wasn't just, mm -hmm. hey, you know, I feel joy joyous. It's like, you know, I have earned my joy and I'm gonna sign all my books that way. Uh, yeah. When Lucille did it, you know, I always knew that it was a kind of claiming. Mm -hmm. With that exclamation mark. Yes, yeah, so exclamation point. Yeah. Um, well, I think we have, I see there are some questions. Um, cool in the chat and, sure. uh, are you going to read them or Jamie, are you going to read them yeah so i'm here to help moderate the questions as agreed upon and we do have some really great questions coming in um i think people have been really enjoying this and i actually just before we start on the questions give me one second here and i'm going to put the chat on because sometimes people just like to chat here at this point uh we're in the more informal part um so the question with the most upvotes is to, um, asking can you both speak about the craft of poetry, uh, how do you decide what form a poem will take and how do you know when a poem is done? Tracy's an expert, I'll just, you know. <laughs> I'll give my little two cents. Um, I feel that, um, you know, we often think of um, craft as something that's visible and inherited and received and it is, um, but I'm also very eager to 
find or forge uh, quieter or softer um, craft based choices to help rein in or govern or guide the questions and, and unrest that really bring me to the page. Sometimes for me, it's about um, a sonic or rhythmic movement that I can almost ride into um, a question or a thought with. Um, limits that I put on myself help me to figure out where I need to say less and more, where I need to shift directions. Um, and so it's almost always for me a tool that helps me move through something that I otherwise wouldn't be able to um, to navigate with um, certainty or courage. See, I told you she she uh, the only problem is I have to go after that. Um, the oh, that was brilliantly said. I think what I would say is for me uh, I would be refer to the people whose work helped me, um, and some of them were very much. Um, Poets who, sorry, I've got a call. Uh, poets who were writing about, I don't know, uh, their lives, but using both formal form, like Seamus sometimes, but he did it in such a subtle way you didn't know. Uh, and I see that as the goal. Um, and then someone like uh, Denise Levertov, who I studied with, who was really terrific uh, about getting us to think about organic form and, and your own kinds of line breaks and where you were uh, in your own work and that that line break helped with that sonic quality you're talking about. And one of the things that I helped me realize is that I had my own, well, A, she helped me realize you weren't trying to build a chair, you're trying to like build a tree. Uh, and like, how do you build a tree? It takes time, it takes water, it takes light, you know? Um, and then the other side is that she also uh, helped me understand that my sonic map will, will inevitably be very different than someone else's. And I certainly saw that when I was starting to write about the blues and things like that. Uh, and a poem's done probably when you're starting to, for me, when I'm turning the, every the into a uh, and every uh, a into the, and suddenly I'm like, you know, I'm just messing around, you know, and uh, the core of the poem uh, has been untouched. Um, uh, that's always an interesting moment. And it's hard to let go. I've learned to do that, but you have to. Okay, great answers. Thank you. Um, so... Uh, this is for Kevin in particular. It says, congratulations on the anthology. And I, I would agree with that. It's a remarkable achievement. A number of the poets in the book refer to Paul Lawrence Dunbar. How do you and Tracy think about Dunbar? Why is he so important to respond to or perhaps resist in the African-American tradition? Well, I can jump in there. I mean, I, I wrote a whole chapter on Dunbar in the Grey album. So I, I've thought about him a lot for years. Um, I think we all have. I think, you know, Dunbar being the first popular in the broadest sense poet. I mean, he, he sold tons of copies of his books. He was, you know, schools were named after him. He was a point of uh, racial and other kinds of pride uh, is one of the reasons that uh, Dunbar is so important. And I also think Dunbar was a great poet. Uh, he would uh, sometimes gets read as this sort of conflict between the standard English poems he wrote uh, uh, we wear the mask and poems, you know, that like, uh, you know, Negro love song or uh, jump back, honey, jump back, like poems that like really were beautiful uh, and in dialect. And I think that's a kind of false distinction. And I spent many pages <laughs> trying to show that. So uh, I won't redo that now, except to say, I think that you know, those kind of dilemmas, even if they're not accurate, are ones that still come up. Like, what is a poem? Is it your inner voice? Is it uh, written in formal English? What is, is it in slang? How do you write a poem? Um, but this faced every writer and with black writers, I think it, it became really fraught uh, around Dunbar's time and after, partially because of his, his success. And even a poet like James Weldon Johnson had dialect poems. I mean, it was fairly standard uh, fare. Um, but, you know, you realize reading other people's how hard it is to do it right. And Dunbar was really good at it. Um, and someone like Sterling Brown, I think, just to take an example, terrific poet who wrote in dialect, uh, and I would say uh, more in a vernacular, it wasn't that shaped by sort of writtenness, it was shaped by spokenness. Um, and, you know, poets and, and writers like Zora Neale Hurston, I think, you know, blew the lid off all of these kinds of questions, but there's still ones that come up. Uh, but I, I think that's one of the reasons people see him as a touchstone. Okay. Wonderful answer. I would also say that I'm 
urge to think, you know, when I think about the what seems to be that easy dichotomy that you describe and what, what you kind of urge us to see as something that's more complex um, and nuanced, it makes me think, what are the what are the voices of self that I'm willing to um, inhabit in my poems? And for whom am I speaking? Right. Um, and I think those are choices that you, you don't just make once. I think that there are choices that come back to you and the stakes are different from different times. Um, and I think a lot of poets now are, are inviting vernacular into the work in so many different ways. And Absolutely. It has an effect. Sometimes it's you know, like philosophical when I think of what Jericho Brown does and, and his work and um, or Morgan Parker, it opens up a new vocabulary for the stakes that we live with and the versions of ourselves that we bring to those stakes. I couldn't agree more. My head is, is just a bobblehead at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, that kind of leads it nicely a little bit into the next question about uh, for you both. I'm um, like, when you write, uh, Virginia wants to know, Virginia Kerr, when you write, who do you imagine as your audience? And does that imagined person or persons change depending on the poem? I think for me, it changes um, depending on other things. And I'll start out by saying that I've always told myself that I'm talking to myself and that my poems um, are about moving outward through the voice and the mind to um, get to maybe some buried knowledge or buried um, understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I feel a little, I feel that way, that drives my work, but there's a part of me now that is very much actively and consciously speaking to a community of blackness in these new poems that I'm, that I'm writing. Um, I also think it's important to acknowledge that these are poems that will have other readers. And what I'm asking those readers to do is to find a different position within those poems and to recognize that sometimes you are um, a, tangentially at most being addressed. And that's an important um, position to inhabit, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, some of the question, you know, it's like, how do we talk about Black English? And one of its functions is to uh, transmit things, information. Ain't is a different word than isn't. Uh, it means something different. Uh, even if it's not an abbreviation of that, you know, y'all is a different word. It's its own word. Or to use Jericho Brown as your example, and them, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, and them, and them, um, you know, like Craig and them. Uh, I think that that's what's amazing is is that language is where that lives. You know, those those kind of choices, and you know, people uh, switch around all the time, even in a sentence. You know. Um, and, and I think that's the thing that, say, you know, not to go back to dialect, dialect gets wrong is it only understands uh, on or off switch, you know, like mm -hmm. dialect all the time and that it's mangled English. And what I was trying to talk about is like breaking English, you know, you get to sort of break dancing, you know, like there's a lot more uh, at stake and, and mm -hmm. interesting there. But the questions about audience, I mean, I both think about it a lot and I don't think about it a lot. Um, you know, sometimes you're writing for a future self. Sometimes you're writing for a distant self. Sometimes it's a past self. Sometimes it's for distant others. Sometimes it's for someone very close that you can't quite say that thing to. And sometimes that is the self. Um, you know, I think a lot about uh, my son sometimes when I'm writing and what he'll think of a poem, especially if it has him in it. Um, and so, but sometimes you're writing a poem to him, for him to read later, you know, or, or the person who might be him. Uh, and that might be the ideal reader uh, one day. Um, I think I think of it the other way too, which is how do we as audience members read? What's our responsibility to poems? Because it, it isn't just on poets, it's also to audience members. And one of the things I think is that, you know, we have to be generous. We have to meet poems where they live. Um, you know, I try to think of it like when I meet someone new, I want to take them on their terms and um, try to understand them before I, you know, dismiss them or see them as, uh, something uh, different. And so uh, being open is one of the qualities that poetry, I think, helps you think about with reading. There's many poets uh, who I read uh, uh, at one time who I didn't totally understand and came to love more later. Uh, Walcott, for instance, I don't think Walcott's like, for, for me, like for a 16 year old, he wasn't like helping me uh, think about it. But, you know, for someone who is writing now, you know, like I just go, oh my God, he's he's talking about beauty and death and these things that persist. And uh, 
uh, help us think about. So there's, you know, I hope in the book and in one's reading, there's people for everyone and moments that different poets speak to you um, and, and think about where audience members have their own, you know, things they can bring to the table. Okay, great. Oh, we have, have so many great uh, questions here. I'm going to try and get to as many of them as we can. We might not be able to get them um, to all of them. Um, one of the uh, earlier questions was um, from Gail Mitchell, and uh, she's actually going to be leading a session for us at the library um, on this book as part of the initiative. And she wants to know, um, she says, now that you are both at the zenith of your careers, <laughs> professional tips that Sorry. you offer to, upcom to offer to upcoming as well as senior citizen poets. So you have any tips for the beginners or those that are senior citizens in the poetry world? Well, uh, I'm sitting in a messy office just off screen. So Zenith, I don't know. But, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think that, you know, I know yeah. it occurs to me that I've been publishing 30 years, you know. Um, so it is something I've obviously done for a while. Um, and I know you've been publishing a while, too, and doing this a while. I'm not sure. Does it change? Has it changed? You know, what's exciting is some of the things we were talking about before, which is that these younger writers are, are I think, able to represent and recognize and, and just sort of carry on with the notion that Black poetry is at the center of the conversation. And that was something that some of the groups we were involved in early on fought for, you know, and, and I think that's really uh, an important, exciting moment. So that, to me, is the most transformative thing. Um, in terms of advice, I mean, I think there's never too late or too early. You know, I, I had people, I started publishing quite young and uh, I think there was a time when people kind of treated it like it was strange or like, you know, you're gonna burn yourself out or something like that. And people like Seamus, I think were really great at helping me understand that poetry could be a life and a life's work. Uh, and it didn't necessarily come with accolades, it's a vocation, it's a calling. And we sort of talked about this in the beginning. Um, and so for me, that kind of calling, you can't get away from or anything. You have to re re recognize it, uh, cherish it, try to feed it, um, especially in a time like now. And, you know, little steps lead to a lot of things. No book was written all at once in one night. Uh, so you have to just keep at it slowly. Uh, and I find when I, you know, the piles that I'm talking about are piles of paper because I'll like, you know, pull something off. And like one day after a matter of time, I'm like, oh, I have something that might be a book one day. Yeah, I um, I love that, and I, I would also say that what's one of the things that's really sustained me um, is community. And for me, that's many different things. But in terms of keeping my poetry, keeping my faith in a practice um, during times when it would be easy to sort of like turn against it or feel you know give in to a feeling of, of defeat or rejection it's just like the one or three or four people whose voices i believe in who understand what i am seeking to do and that has these are been, people uh living friends or they, yeah. these are yeah. well okay so they're the voices that we you know the people who feed us on in their work but i'm talking about like you know the three or four people from grad school or from from sure. just life who um i trust with my work and i can turn yeah. to what i need to be chastened in some way. Yeah. Well, you don't need 50 of those. You just need a handful. Yeah. One, it can be your dog. You know, you can read to your dog and your dog can be that bouncing back to you. Um, so, you know, I just keep at it is what I always say. Yeah, and you know, workshops are so important, but they're also such a false indicator of what the work of a writer actually is. It's not to um, a, a, a sort of appease 10 or 12 people <laughs> around the table. It's right. not a process where you can democratically say who wants me to keep this line exactly. who doesn't exactly. it's about you know making a choice to to listen to um yourself and to learn to do that by listening to just just the i don't know the, the rare perspective that that um is valuable to you i'll say one last thing i know we want to get to this question it's that weird balance between the demon editor who you have to let in after you get your draft and the the encouraging friend who's also in you that has to say you know what you, you're you know you're you're not doing too bad like you have to balance that out and the people i know who have too much of one or the other they end up in a different place you know like i you have to like your work enough to like want to change it you know and and i think that that's the hardest thing uh to sustain 
Yeah. Well, we did have a couple other questions, but we're all, we actually are at the top of our hour here. We're going a little bit over. And I want to close with a poem from each of you one more time. It could be something from the book or something if, you, if you're prepared. I know you had a few prepared or if you have a book handy. Tracy, are you prepared with another poem? Uh, sure. I, I'm going to just pull this off the shelf because it's um, really familiar to me. And then, Kevin, we'll have you finish with maybe something from the anthology or something that you want to share with us. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Okay. okay. Um, this poem is called An Old Story. Um, I wrote it trying to uh, write a new myth that could be helpful to the um, world we're living in right now. An Old Story. We were made to understand it would be terrible. Every small want, every niggling urge, every hate, swollen to a kind of epic wind, livid the land, and ravaged like a rageful dream. The worst in us having taken over and broken the rest utterly down. A long age passed when at last we knew how little would survive us, how little we had mended or built that was not now lost. Something large and old awoke and then our singing brought on a different manner of weather. Then animals long believed gone crept down from trees. We took new stock of one another. We wept to be reminded of such color. Mm. Beautiful. I love hearing that. So since we were mentioning her, um, I thought I would read a uh, last poem by Lucille Clifton, uh, which is from the anthology and from her terrific work. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay. My one hand holding tight, my other hand, come, celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. It's Lucille. Wow. Perfect way to end. Uh, I can't believe we've been on here an hour. It seems like only a minute. And I think we could all stay another hour. Um, but unfortunately, we will have to close down for now. Um, we will be, as I said, this has been recorded. It is gonna go on the amazing Lift Every Voice website. And that, as I said, the link is there. I encourage everybody to go visit. Of course, purchase the anthology. Hold it up again, Kevin, for everybody to see. It is it is a marvel. Um, we also have many copies at the library. Great. So um, if you want to, um, there's a, a little bit of a wait list going. We have like three or four copies in circulation. I think another one on order. And we're gonna be discussing it at our December 10th Black Voices Book Group. We will be discussing this book and we'll have other programs on it coming up in January and February. So keep an eye out. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I think I'm getting a bit of feedback. Hopefully you can't hear it out there in the world. I think it's just on my end, great. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Kevin. Thank you so much, Tracy. This has been a delightful evening. You can see that there's people here that are just so appreciative. Um, actually, one of our questions was not a question, but a comment from uh, Scott McVeigh, who organizes um, the Poetry Festival every year here, the Dog Poetry Festival, um, thanking you, Ke Kevin, for the masterful work in putting together this anthology. Um, so thank you, Scott, for that comment. And you can see all the other uh, wonderful thank yous going by in the, in the chat room right now. Um, we've had 170 people join us from across the world. We had represented. And so this has been a really wonderful evening, both for the library and for the Lift Every Voice project. And we want to thank you. And the awkward part of this, where we just wave and say goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Kevin. Thank you, everybody. Great to see you. Great.